Welcome back to Blue Collar Startup, everyone. I'm your co-host, Mike Nelson, joined today by visionary founder and who I call the host of the show, Derek Foster. Just a co-host. I mean, you're the guy, though. <laughs> you have the radio voice. We were just. I know about that's it. true. I I do. Uh, maybe I should be on the radio. Hey, you can do anything you put your mind. You got any connections there? I'm going to quit, <laughs> no, I'm gonna quit marketing and go on the radio. <laughs> Anyway, uh, super excited to be back here. We had a little bit of a hiatus, a couple weeks off. Uh, I think it was like two or three weeks. We had vacations, the whole deal. So uh, a little rusty, but happy and excited to jump back into things, especially with the guests today. Very excited to talk to these people. Uh, But before we do, I just wanted to uh, give a quick shout out to Luke Michaels at the Michaels Group uh, for being one of our sponsors. And because of their sponsorship, actually, we're able to donate some money to a couple of organizations which I don't know if it's official yet, so we won't we won't announce what that that is yet. But we're we're soon. almost there, just clearing a couple of hurdles. Almost there. Okay. okay, very excited. So, and if you don't know, uh, you know, we're really trying to do things that benefit the blue collar industries uh, and the people that work in those industries or aspiring blue collar, whether it's staff members, support members, or business owners. And, uh, you know, that's why we're here. It's why we're doing what we're doing. Exactly. Try to hand down all those, you know, tools, so to speak to everybody. So uh, again, just huge shout out to Luke Michaels and the Michaels group. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the sponsorship. So uh, we're actually, in, we're joined today by three guests in the studio. This is exciting, right? So Derek and I are going to be sharing a microphone. So uh, so if I sound a little distant, yes. that's why. That's right, because I've got the microphone. Uh, so I'm going to let you guys introduce yourselves, though, right? Uh, so we're joined by the team, which, by the way, before we actually introduce you, I just got to say something that's really cool that I noticed on your website is that you're at the bottom Yes. And that's, I'm talking to the CEO. So it, it, it's, I thought it was really cool. I'm like scrolling through, seeing the, seeing the team members and, and you put yourself at the bottom. And I thought that was a really cool, uh, touch and probably, uh, something that really speaks to who you are as a leader. And so I, I can't wait to talk to you a little bit more about that. So why don't we start with you, introduce yourself and then we'll, uh, we'll go around the room. Absolutely. So that's very intentional. I'm yeah. glad that you noticed that. Uh, I'm Amanda Triolo, the CEO at Grasshopper. And I love that I'm here with, two of my coworkers, really. And uh, because a lot of people, you know, I get on podcasts and people want to talk to me and they want to talk about the growth of Grasshopper, who we are as a company. But the truth is this company is nothing without the leaders and our leadership team. And then the leaders, you know, the the people that are following them and the ones that they're leading of what, what makes us who we are as a company, right? So I love being able to share the microphone with my team because that's it's who we are it's how we built it brian's been with me since pretty much the beginning um he's my guy so i'm very excited that he's here it's his first podcast so show him some love on that one but i'm amanda welcome brian yeah how we doing we good man first First one under the belt first one under the belt i think we'll uh hopefully we nail this one i'm sure i'm sure you guys are gonna do great but I don't know. I mean, the jury's still out, maybe. But, you know. <laughs> we'll see what the list is. I, I, you guys, I bet you guys, with the growth that you guys have seen, I'm sure that you uh, you do well under pressure. So we'll find out, I guess, right? We function best under pressure. That's right. That's right. Uh, and Brian, what's your what's your title over there? What are you doing over at Grasshopper? So currently right now, I am a uh, leader of uh, residential install, but I uh, wear many hats as well. Um, so I dabble in a little bit of uh, the service uh, side of it as well, and I... Uh, oversee new construction he's being really humble (laughs) he's about to step into the gm role Um, he's about to hand the torch over and empower somebody else to run a residential install which he's done a phenomenal job on getting that department fully operational fully proficient profitable efficient um so he's being humble but he's about to step into the gm role that's awesome congratulations congrats man appreciate it thank you yeah it's very exciting i mean just to to be able to be in many positions throughout the company and throughout the journey that we've had. Um, and then to start and to land where I'm going now is, is, is pretty exciting. So um, up for the challenge as always. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, sky's the limit for grasshopper. I bet. So Luke, let's introduce you. So Luke actually is a futuristic hire that we brought on that we're extremely uh, proud, honored, humbled to be able to have him on the team. Um, Do you want to talk about how we met each other? Yeah. So I, uh, my name's Luke. Thanks for having us guys. Uh, I'm our director of customer experience. Do you have a last name, Luke? My last name is Scar Kelly, Luke Scar Kelly. 
uh, director of customer experience at uh, Grasshopper Heating and Cooling. Um, and how did I meet Amanda? I met Amanda through my previous position. Um, I was running a, a 15 week program um, through a not for profit funded by the Department of Labor that trained individuals uh, for a career in HVAC. Um, and through that, I was introduced to Grasshopper uh, as one of our partners for that organization. Um, and Grasshopper is still a partner of that uh, not profit, that uh, not for profit, and that organization. Once I saw what was going on at Grasshopper, um, all the amazing things, the growth, uh, the employee focused um, mindset that the whole company has, I immediately became very attracted to Grasshopper. I reached out to uh, Vice President of Operations Kelly and said, Hey, what can I do to be a part of this? And uh, one thing led to another, and here I am at Grasshopper as our Director of Customer Experience. And I'm really, really excited to help Grasshopper get to that next level because we're already doing amazing. We're going to be going from good to great. And we're going to do that by continuing to focus on our employees. And if we're able to do that, and that's that's what my role is, help us take care of our employees. Because if we do that, we're taking care of our customers. Uh, so I'm really excited to uh, to get my career started here at Grasshopper. I'm about a month and a half in, and uh, it's been going fantastic. Yeah, our goal is to take such great care of our people that they take even better care of our customers. Yeah, it's amazing. It's great. Yeah. What, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I have to, I really want, I know we have our outline, but I, I want to start off with, I, I had not heard of you guys. And then all of a sudden, I can't not but see you, hear from you. Like, I, I you know, so I'd really love to hear, like, my first question is, how long have you been in business? Since January 1st of 2016. 16. Okay. So that's but seven years. We have not always been grasshopper. Okay. So I actually uh, stepped into a and took over a commercial only install company. Uh, so I was flipping houses at the time, managing an accounting office. So I thought, okay, I can handle a challenge and I know numbers, right? So I think I can handle this. Let me see if I can turn the company around, what we can do with it. So I stepped into it and it was a lot harder than I thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, Turned out the, I, I knew very early on the con, the commercial construction world was not it for me. There was not much passion to be found in it. It was cutthroat, you know, they'll, it's public bid work. So they'll take mm -hmm. the lowest bidder and then you, you're setting people up. If you can even find people, the, the picking is, was slim, um, is unrealistic job deadlines, high stress work environments and very low profit margins. So like what can somebody actually be passionate about through that? Right. I'm sure there's people that can be, or there's people that do it just to turn a lot of revenue, but that's not anything I'm passionate about. So my passion is leading people to become the best versions of themselves. I couldn't accomplish that through commercial, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I hired Brian and Brian actually went out and he did sales for me. We were coworkers at a previous job. That's how we knew each other. And he brought in a multi-million dollar contract in the first 60 days. Rockstar. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So we were like, oh my gosh, we have all this work now. Great. Money won't be a problem, but where do we find the people, mm -hmm. right? We didn't have the people. So literally he's like, I'll put my boots on. So he went from selling, having no idea about HVAC to diving into the field, learning HVAC, helping to lead people, helping to lead job sites. I mean, it was crazy. Truly an incredible guy. But that was the commercial world, right? So it's like, okay, we have money, we have job now, people. And then mm -hmm. it was just like money, job, people. That's the only thing we cared about at the time. It's like, well, we can't really sustain a business with this, right? Like, how do you keep growing and scale with that? So fast forward some time, you know, it's like, are we going to go bankrupt this week? Are we not? It was it was stressful. You never know when you're going to get paid either. What you know? are you talking about? Owning a business <laughs> is the easiest thing ever. <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that, you know, come yeah. on. It's like, no, there's <laughs> times where we're like, look, we need to get to the drawing board because if we don't, we're not going to have money for payroll next week, right? So uh, fast forward some time and we're like, you know, for the, from 2017 to 2020, I kept trying to figure out how do I pivot from commercial to residential mm -hmm. without bankrupting the company. And I couldn't figure out how to get the cash flow to stay flowing to make payroll pay vendors to halting that down to nothing and then building up residential. I couldn't figure out the switch and we didn't have enough people, nor did I have enough funds to front load bringing residential people in to do that. And so something called COVID came out of left field and the governor shut down construction job sites, right? 
I had zero business overnight and we laid off, uh, we had 12 people. We laid off all but four. I didn't take a paycheck for four, four months cause I had no idea what was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And Brian and I game plan and we're like, these are the people we can't afford to lose no matter what comes out of it. We kept them on payroll. There was really nothing for them to do. And we immediately dove into residential. I went on YouTube. You'll appreciate this. <laughs> I YouTubed how to optimize Google ads nice. and how to create my own Google ad page. And I literally had, I was up for over 24 hours straight just to get, you know, when somebody would Google heating repair that I'd come up. You'll also appreciate that I had ads running in Albany, Oregon and was getting calls from Albany, Oregon, which is Very terrible. Nice. <laughs> but you know what? I, I learned know I one. learned that I had a hiccup and I needed to fix it, but I learned early on. So I wasn't blowing a ton of marketing dollars. But it, the fact of the matter is we did what we needed to to pivot, to keep moving, mm-hmm. right? So um, when that happened and the phone started ringing for residential, you know, I went, I took to social media and what I saw is all across the United States, I was connecting with all these people I didn't know and they all owned home service companies, whether it was garage doors, cleaning, plumbing, electrical, HVAC, whatever it was. And they all stayed moving. And like none of these people were going bankrupt or fearing losing their business. And I'm like, what, what are they doing differently or what do they have that I don't have? So what I found was they all had really great branding and they all really knew what they were doing in residential, right? So I'd researched their websites. I'd spent hours researching them on Google. So I finally found, landed with a company um, who rebrands some of the United States top home service companies. And they, I hired them to rebrand us actually with the last 20,000 we had in the bank. I said, we don't have a choice. It's either we're going to keep spinning tires here and just have enough calls and I won't be able to bring my staff on to, I don't know what we're going to do, right? Mm-hmm. So we um, dove headfirst and took the leap on rebranding and that's where Grasshopper was born. And it was one of the names they presented us with and uh, grasshoppers only move in a forward direction and they're responsible for decomposition and regrowth in the ecosystem, which decomposition and regrowth is the story of our company. So because of those two things and our philosophy was just stay moving forward, right? Our tagline is forward is a way of life, paralleling that grasshoppers only move forward. So there's much passion and purpose behind the brand itself. Hey, that's awesome. Yeah. That's, yeah. Cool. that's a good story. Yeah. I'm thinking, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm pausing because I have all these jokes in my head right now. But, like, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, like, oh, like grasshoppers on the calls, like, oh, we'll jump right on it, right? Just, we did an amazing job. I mean, the colors, the vehicle wraps, everything. I mean, it's loud. You see it, you can't miss it. I saw one of the vans on the way here, so mm-hmm. well done. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Amazing. Like, I literally, like, hadn't heard you guys and all of a sudden could not help but hear about you, see you, like, there's people that were coming to our BNI. Like, you just, all of a sudden you were everywhere. I went to yeah. an event at... 550, you guys had some crazy big thing going on there. <laughs> like, yeah, you're just everywhere I, every time I turn around. And then literally, uh, I got a text from Derek one day. He's like, do you know anybody over at Grasshopper? I'm like, wait a minute, man. I keep seeing these guys. Like, yeah, I don't, but I would <laughs> like to know the people over at Grasshopper. So really excited. We're a good time. On. Yeah, you guys, you guys are fun. That's good. But that yeah. was the goal, right? Is you can look at a name like Grasshopper, heating and cooling, and think that it's laughable or comical or mm-hmm. like who the heck would name their company that? Truthfully, we had the same opinion in the beginning until we saw the meaning behind it and the brand and the brand story that we could build off of it, right? So it's about being top of mind and it's about being unforgettable. And mm-hmm. I think we accomplished those. And what, like, like, I think of like McDonald's. You see the golden arches, right? You don't need to see McDonald's. You just know that it's McDonald's because of the golden arches. Mm-hmm. When you see Gary, the grasshopper, mm-hmm. we don't want people to know, what is that? No, we want to see Gary Grasshopper, Grasshopper. Yeah, that's, that's it. We don't need to see that's the That's Grasshopper's name is we Gary. Yeah, him. we've named him Gary. That's great. That yeah. is great. <laughs> uh, who came up with Gary? So truthfully, Kara. Uh, Kara's, Kara was with me before, right when COVID hit. Actually, COVID ended her career. She was an event planning uh, planner and designer for weddings and events. Um, so obviously her career came to a screeching halt and we scooped her up. I was like, I don't know what the heck we're going to do with you, but come on, you're a ball of energy. I'm sure you can accomplish that. <laughs> so as soon as the, the brand launched, we threw around like Gregory da, 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 and she's like, I know his name is going to be Gary. And I'm like, Gary, Gary, the grasshopper. That's it. There you go. <laughs> Very nice. Gary was yeah. born. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of want to uh, circle back a little bit because I think what an important thing it is for people to understand you know like we, everyone in today's marketplace and you know they're on tiktok and instagram and being an entrepreneur and a business owner so glorified and you know you know everybody's got their big shiny cars in their instagram profiles and all that stuff but i people don't often talk about or or maybe at least we try to talk about as much as we can like 
the struggle that goes into owning a business and the trials and tribulations of what it takes. Like it's not just floating around every day and, you know, playing video games and drinking coffee and being a boss. Like what, when you're going through that whole pivot, like, I mean, how did that feel emotionally? That's <laughs> It was one of the most unique feelings I've ever experienced. But, you know, I had faith in myself. And I love that you said that because I speak at events now, right, all Mm -hmm. across the United States. And you can look at my Facebook page and think that I'm an overnight success or it appears that I'm an overnight success. And I try to be as transparent as possible that it never was this way. In mm-hmm. fact, I almost went bankrupt. And I, if COVID didn't happen and they actually helped out some businesses at the time, I can't say I'd even be sitting here talking to you, yeah. you know? So it's that failure is okay and mistakes are okay. And having to figure it out a few times until you can figure it out is okay. But most importantly, it's being able to pivot and for the lack of a better term, moving forward, right? It's okay to take two steps backwards if it means that you're able to take 10 more forward. Mm-hmm. Um, it was one of the most unique feelings of my life though, because I knew my biggest responsibility was the people that trusted me mm-hmm. and the people that looked to me like, look, Amanda, the world's in shambles right now. You're changing the business. They shut down construction job sites. You're not at the office because I didn't. I stayed home and I crunched. I'd pull all nighters just to figure out how to get the phone ringing. What do we need to do? And it's like, it was like all or nothing for me. That was the feeling I can describe. Everything was on the line. I had faith in myself. I just didn't know how we were going to do it, how we were going to get there. But Mm -hmm. I knew that we weren't going to fail because we were going to figure it out. It's the the zero option mentality, right? That's it. (laughs) Yep. If you listen to Andy Frisella. Yeah. You guys listen to Andy Frisella? Yes. Nice. You kind of look like you would actually (laughs) listen to Andy Frisella. It's the, the, the tattoos and the, you know, all the, the whole... The whole look. The vibe. The vibe. Absolutely. And it's interesting that you say that too, because, um, about like COVID and the pivot and forcing the pivot. Cause I know that we as a company, same, we had a similar situation where we had changes that we needed to make in our company, needed to, or we weren't going to survive. And COVID literally gave me the opportunity to make those changes where we were able to change the way that we work with our clients, what we do for our clients, how we get paid by our clients. Uh, cause we were a big, retainer company. We were a big social media company. And like we were talking about before, social media just wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing anymore. Right. Right. And so we were like, how do, how do you tell 60 clients that, Hey, by the way, we're going to change our entire scope and we need you to pay us differently than what you've paid us in the past. And and how do you, how do you keep, we had 12 employees, same thing going into, in COVID. And then, uh, then it was just me. It's yeah. crazy, isn't yeah. it? I just knew I'm like, you know, I can I can pay my mortgage for the next few months and I can take care of my car payment. Actually, I deferred my car payments because I was so scared I was going to have no money. Yeah. Because they were offering to defer them. And I'm like, you know what? I need to defer my car payments right now because I have to save for every dollar I have left because them making payroll is the most important thing because if I lose them, I really have nothing. Right. You know what I mean? So that's, that's what it was. It's like, forget about me. You know, I, I can take care of me. If I need to go work three more jobs... It, Float yep. some money if I need to. You know, it's that not many people are built with that mentality, though, right? And a lot of people will become victims. So you hear a lot of COVID stories. And, you know, God bless because COVID did shut down a lot of companies. Yeah. And there's other people, though, that can look at it through a different scope. And it's not the victim scope of it. And it's every single thing that happens to us in life, whether it's good, bad, ugly, is an opportunity for change, an Mm -hmm. opportunity to see something or grab some sort of purpose out of it. And although it felt really messed up at the time, like, what is this? We have to stay indoors. The world as we know, it just came to a screeching halt. My business is about to go bankrupt. It's like, well, something's got to come out of this, you know? So I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm not going to be the same person on the other side of it, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's being able to look at things through a different perspective and, and, I have a saying. My saying is, go ahead, Brian. Uh, everything is manageable. Everything has a solution. And leadership at Grasshopper, that is that is our philosophy, right? There are, you know, nothing that we do, right? We can always find a way to, to figure something out. And, you know, whether it takes, you know, multiple people on leadership or even your team or whatever, it, it we will always figure it out. Everything is manageable. Everything has a solution. And that's just how we, how we go. And I There's mean, no, no stress. No stress. There's situations yeah. that come up, but everything is manageable. Everything has a solution. Nobody needs to be in a... Rea- we don't have a reactive culture like that, 
right? Um, we've got vision and values that we point back to, and that's how we make all of our decisions. So while you were going through that, and this is a question because, you know, the I can only imagine the amount of stress that, thank you, Mike, You're welcome. The, the amount of stress that you were under during that time frame and the transition. So what did you do to keep yourself calm and positive? Because it, when you're getting, and like, I like to call it punched in the face day after day as, you know, a business owner, mm -hmm. uh, what, what are some tactics that you use to stay positive? So I'm a firm believer in celebrating all milestones, even if they're just minor, right? That moves the needle even just a little bit or moves an individual even just a little bit. So really what we clung to was celebrating every single time the phone rang, celebrating every single time we booked a service call, celebrating the first uh, furnace we sold. So we never installed anything for residential, but we've installed a ton for commercial. This was... April of 2020. So we had our first service tech go out to our first service call <laughs> that we were able to get the phone to ring for. And he sold that customer a furnace because the, I don't know how much you know about furnaces, but the um, heat ex not much. <laughs> okay, the heat exchanger was cracked, which means it was omitting carbon monoxide into the home. So it really was a safety okay. issue. But um, we sold a furnace. So just like that, we had $6,000 in the bank we were able to pull two people to get a furnace installed, but it's like, okay, maybe we just went from 12,000 in the bank to 18,000 in the bank. Like this is enough. Like how do I get more of this? So we would like find motivation in small things that would like motivate us and empower us to work three times harder to make that happen again. That's amazing. Yeah. So, and how many employees do you have now? 62? 63. Um, 63. 63. Wow. 63. And, it, and in terms of keeping the energy up and, and keeping that positivity, okay. it's kind of impossible to go to work at Grasshopper and not be in a good mood. <laughs> I mean, it, it, the, the, the energy that you feel at 7 o'clock in the morning, 7.30 in the morning with music going, with everybody out, basketball hoop outside, guys getting ready for their jobs, getting all their stuff. And it, it's hard not to be in a good mood. I mean, it's just that culture is already there. It's already built. And it's, it's really cool to experience. So I would love to, I would love to hear you guys tell us about like, how did you build that culture? I mean, so again, you were given a unique opportunity yeah. to basically start over, right. which is what you wanted to do, needed to do. And then, so where did the idea of building that culture and doing all those things came from or, and how did yeah. you do it? So on February 1st of 2021 was the day Grasshopper launched, believe it or not. So about two and a half years ago. And for the first year, um, so people, technicians, people who saw the branding started contacting us wanting to work for us, right? So the phone started to ring. We had no recruiting ads out at all, none. And people started wanting to work for us. And it's, this is awesome. People are coming to us. We don't have to beg people and meet that. Like I would literally park at gas stations, wait for vans to roll up and go and introduce myself to them and hand them my business card because we were so desperate for people. And I did find two employees that way, by the way. Um, but what I say that to say like, okay, our brand looks legit, but our inside is not legit. Right. Um, so what I did was I actually hired a leadership coach for myself and he's still my leadership coach to this day. And he's the leadership coach of every single person on my leadership team individually. And then we come together as a group once a month and he really challenged me and forced me into out of my comfort zone into many uncomfortable conversations where I had no choice but to shut up and say, I don't know. You're right. You know what I mean? So we had a poster on the wall when you would walk into the office and it was a beautiful poster and it said grasshopper and every single letter. So the G R A, you know, all the way down had words and we called those our values. My, my leadership coach walks in one day and he's like, Hey, that values poster out there. Awesome. Motivating words. Can you tell me what your values are? <laughs> And embarrassingly enough, I could only like rattle off two of them. And he's like, so how do you run a company if you don't have any values? And I was like, we don't. No idea. We don't. And he's like, so how do you handle discipline? How do you handle 
saying yes to business or saying no to business. What does that look like? You know, and we were, we were having some employee issues at the time because we just didn't have proper structure in place. And it's like, we, we were fun. We were still fun, right? We still had a good time. We still worked hard, but we were missing that huge accountability piece. There was zero accountability, none at all. And my leadership coach challenged me and he said, you need to values need to be something you guys live by, but not just you. Every single person needs to know them inside and out. And every single decision you make needs to be based on those. And I was like, okay. So I, it actually took me a few months um, to narrow them down. He's like, you can't have more than six. And I'm like, how do you not have more than six? Like there's so many factors here. So I parallel this to say that a lot of people have words on a wall, right? Integrity, respect, character, profitability, whatever their values are. But I wanted to design my values in a way where they were statements and they couldn't be strayed one way or another. And it was black and white with no gray, right? Because if you're going to fire someone, how are you going to fire someone and say that it was because of integrity? That's a big gray area, right? Mm -hmm. Because integrity could mean something different to you than it does to me. So I was like, I'm going to make them statement values. And he's like, I love it, but you need six of them or less. So let's get it done. Right. So I get it done and I come up with them in our six values. Do you want to say them? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we commit every day to be a team player. Um, we, uh, we serve above and beyond every time and we, uh, we choose growth. We work hard. We play hard. We believe in the power of strong partnerships and, uh, Oh my God, your point we, do what is we right. do what is right, even when right is hard. So those are our six values, right? We choose growth. We believe in the power of strong partnerships. We serve above and beyond every time. We work hard and play hard. We do what is right, even when right is hard. No. We choose growth. We choose growth. So we make every single decision in the company based off of those six values. And if there's disciplinary, it's very simple. It points back to those six. And it's created a culture where... Now it took some ironing out, right? There were some people that didn't buy in and there were some people that didn't fit that culture that were with me previously that didn't make it to the other side. And when we announced these values, I said, I said in a room full of everybody, I said, look, there's going to be some of you here right now that aren't going to be here a year from now. And that's because the, the values here are not going to be something that you believe in or that you yourself feel that you can live by here. And that's okay. And Throughout that year, slowly, they would weed themselves out. And, um, you know, the value that we commit every day to be a team player, that's one of the strongest ones in the sense of that parallels every department connecting to one another in unity. So traditionally at HVAC companies, service can't stand sales because that's a tech term or whatever, or sales can't stand install, install can't stand sales because they're all in different departments. There's no synergy. There's synergy in every single department in my company and one hand washes the other, no matter what department, which we love, but there's values and then there's mission. And our mission statement is who we are as a company. And it's, we create opportunities that change lives and lead people to make great decisions says nothing about heating and cooling, right? So at the end of the day, our purpose as a leadership team is the first part of that mission, which is we create opportunities that change lives. My leadership team and myself, that is our primary responsibility. And that is what we live by day in and day out. Leading people to make great decisions is what we do in the HVAC term side, right? Leading people to make a great decision is whether we go to a system that's one years old, a system that's 20 years old, we operate the exact same for each. We take the time, we build the relationship with the homeowner, we inform and educate. Our goal is to make sure you understand maybe even just one thing further than you did before we got there, or maybe you feel less anxious because you understand something differently. Um, and we'll present you with options if you're interested in what those would be, but it's only if the client leads us to that place of asking the questions to want to know what their options are. We will never sell somebody something that they don't need ever. That's not how we operate. We don't have quotas that they have to meet and there's disciplinary. We slow it down and form and educate. And that's what leading people to make great decisions is for us. It's amazing. I'm processing. <laughs> <laughs> so when we talk about slowing it down to inform and educate, right? For us, um, 
informing and educating is the biggest piece of what separates us because traditionally in HVAC, like right now it's 90 degrees, multiple days in a row. Any other HVAC company is slamming technicians and saying, you need to move through your calls quicker. We're slammed. And they put 12 to 15 calls on their board. We have four, uh, five right now because we're at capacity because we don't ever want to do a disservice to a client just because of our demand, right? We will put calls on the board. We will not overwork and overrun our employees, which is also a culture thing, right? Mm -hmm. In this industry, in HVAC, you will overwork and overrun people. Now, is there a grind time and heats of the season, heights of the season? Yes, absolutely. It's a thing, but we are extremely intentional on giving every single customer an excellent experience every single time, no matter if we are slammed and if we're not, which is why we focus on each customer, customer by customer. That way we're not rushing through them and they are getting about an hour and a half to sometimes two and a half hours of our time if it means properly informing and educating them and taking the time that they want. And there's some people that don't want to be informed and educate. No problem. You know, we'll, we'll come in, do the service, give you your analysis, whatever you want and have a great day. If you need us, we're here, you know, so we tailor each customer experience to the customer that's in front of us without doing a disservice. I have so many questions. Uh, Derek, I don't want to go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I'm just trying to think of where to start. So your core values, your mission. Yes. The two biggest reasons for being able to be where we're at right now. Yeah. And, and so that's, what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the right question to ask to help someone understand why that is, right? Like, why do you think those things mattered so much, even from when it was <clears throat> you and Brian and sounds like three other people, mm -hmm. right? Like, wh why did that stuff matter so much to help you grow so fast? Because 62 employees is a lot of freaking employees. <laughs> and I, I also have questions about process and everything else, but, uh, but let's start with that. Like, why does it matter so much? It matters so much because it's one thing if I understand my company and what I want to do and where I want to be and what we're going to set out to do. It's another thing when I'm able to take that vision and cast that onto my employees so that they understand their future at the company, who we are, what we stand for, and why Grasshopper is the place for them and why Grasshopper is going to take care of them, support them, appreciate them, and why that life change that we talk about, right, our mission statement, that mission statement is who we are. We say it together every Tuesday as a team um, because for us, it's we create opportunities that change lives. So as a leadership team, we're always looking for those opportunities that change lives. And the beautiful part is, is that in the beginning, it's hard to get that buy-in and it's hard to get those tires to spin to gain some traction. But once you parallel your words and your actions and they see that, look, you cannot be aggressive and come to the table with employees and launch values and then not stand by them. The second you do that is the second you lose credibility. So we operate the entire company off of those. And so they feel comforted in that. They're you know, there was a video testimony that we did not too long ago where employees were able to speak freely about our values. And a lot of them talked about how it is a culture of accountability. And the culture of accountability that we've been able to develop takes a lot of pressure off of them because they know they don't have to pick up the slack of other employees who aren't performing. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be frustrated because somebody's being a jerk or anything like that. They know that the culture is so strong that the culture holds the culture accountable, if that makes sense. So, you're going to weed out some bad apples. It's going to take you some time to get traction. But once you parallel those words with actions, and for us, you know, I don't know what your mission statements might be or people who are listening, you know, I firmly believe a mission statement is going to be your ticket to success paired with values. Um, cause I've seen it happen and I've seen it in two and a half years. You know, our first year, we had 2300, oh, almost 2400% growth in our first year, right? But when you parallel, that and you parallel, you know, we say we create opportunities that change lives, but when we have story after story of life change and they see it and they feel it and they're one of them, there's never a doubt and they're the biggest grasshopper advocate even more than me. So what's amazing too is we, we make every new employee to a vision board, one, three, five years. So it kind of gives nice. you a perspective on what they're trying to achieve here at Grasshopper. It's our goal as leadership to make those happen, to make those life changes happen. 
right? So we're constantly sitting down with our employees saying, hey, what do we want to do this year? Do we want to go on a, I think we did, um, what do we want to buy? What do we want to achieve? And what do we want to um, plan? plan, right? Okay, my job as leadership is to make these things happen for you in the next year. So that's what we really focus on, right? It's, it's all about people, right? Um, our people of Grasshopper, that culture, and, and sustaining and keeping that culture nice and strong. And people are just, they're, they're attracted to it, you know? People work for other companies and they start talking about Grasshopper. I had so much fun over here. This is great. And then, you know, it's just word of mouth. And, uh, you know, we, we obviously, we, we do a, a, you know, a strong interview and really, really vet the, the people very well. Yeah, we do a multi-level sure. interview yep. processes. Mm-hmm. They go through many people. We're extremely selective in who we hire. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like, well, why do you want to work for us mm-hmm. instead of interviewing them? Right. So it's not, Hey, I want to work for you. And you're like, great, you got the skill. Let's go. It's like, well, why should we hire you? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, like, why are you a fit to be a grasshopper here? And Luke was very easy hire because <laughs> you could tell he walks the walk and talks the talk. Right. And it's one of the things I love about grasshopper too, is how, how employee focused we are. And that spreads. So if leadership is employee focused, that helps our employees also be employee focused, which means if I finish up a job at five o'clock, but I know I got a coworker who's only two miles down the street and they're finishing up a different job, I want to go help them instead of going back to the shop, going home. No, I want to go help my coworker because I know that they're going to want to help me. And that's just the culture that we have. We support each other. We're inclusive. We give employees agency to say what they want to say, um, talk to us about things that are on their mind. We know what's going on in all of our employees' lives. We want to know because that helps us be better in leadership towards them, but it also helps us manage them and know what's going on. If I know what's going on in Amanda's life and what's Brian's life, I can work with them better. Mm -hmm. I can work with them easier. If I don't know that Brian's got 10 things going on at home and he is so distracted and we both go into a meeting. If I don't know that, I'm going to interact with Brian a little bit differently than if I do know that. And we want our employees to tell us what's going on in their lives and tell us, you know, all of these things so that we can work better together. Right. That's <laughs> so true. Like I'm making mental notes of all the things that you're saying so I can take them back and, you know, look to, to implement them. But, uh, no, a lot We're of recording it so you can actually. Yeah, it's great. I can <laughs> check it out anytime, you know? <laughs> So but, you remember when you said um, how Amanda was on the bottom, right? Yeah, on and, the website. And on the website, right. So we do things differently, too. And this is how we look at it. So our employees, you ever, an org chart, right? Yeah. So our employees, they're they're there on the top. And as we go down, right, that's leadership down. Yeah, it's the like bottom. the upside down org. I mean, so when I saw that, you know, that's, that's, that's how we, we, we are at Grasshopper. We work for our employees. Absolutely. Our employees yeah. don't work for us. So, yeah. Or with you, which I know that you said in the beginning too, and right. I say that all the time too about about the people that I work with here in this company, and and that's it's a real big part of our culture is you don't work for me, we yeah. work together, yeah. And and most cases, our team knows more about what we're doing than I do, you mm-hmm. know. And I, and I, which I also thought about when you were talking too, because you didn't like you don't do HVAC, right? Like you personally, like you're not, is that right? Or I mean, I can die. You can, I'm if sure you call me and you're like, man, I got this don't gun. Yeah. <laughs> I don't go out and install. No. Right. But and, it, and that's what it sounded like was yeah. that you, like you own an HVAC company, but you're not an HVAC, but it's not like you came up in the HVAC yeah. industry nope. and then decided to start your own no. company. I just like, have really great people in the positions that I don't, they're not my jam. Yeah. You know, Abs- I do. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, it seems like similar dynamic, almost like, you know, Brian, your your implementer is similar to Eric and, and our company. So tell us a little bit about what it was like implementing Amanda's vision while putting processes in place. And because obviously things break, stuff goes wrong. How do you maintain that level of morale, even though things are changing, processes are being implemented? What that look like for you guys? Uh, again, it is. It's very simple. Once we got that mission in place, right? Once we got those core values in place and everything revolved around that, right? So it made it very easy, actually, you know, and, and, and carrying a positive attitude throughout the entire day, not taking 
what you, uh, you know, what you have in the outside life, bringing it into work and, you know, always continuing to have that positive attitude day in and day out. And people see that, they feel that. So every day when you go in, right, it's, you're here, we're at work because we love work. We love to be here. We want to be here. And, uh, it, it, you know, that mission, you know, we create opportunities that change lives. It's me helping other people, right? Helping Amanda help other people. And, and being able to help them through change yeah. too, right? Because not people don't like to adapt to change. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes it's, it happens in Grasshopper, right? We implement a new policy and the policy shifts and they're not comfortable with it. So it's being uncomfortable for a little while until they see the benefit, right? But it's them trusting that the lead or the company has their best interests in mind for those changes. And um, we are a high change culture. Um, I didn't hire a best practices group that came in and said, this is how you run your company successfully. We've done everything by trial and error. So you can imagine there's been change after change after change, right? We've learned the hard way. We've failed. But the difference, I think, at Grasshopper, right, with a culture of accountability and just kind of how I operate and then how leadership flows beyond there is we are very transparent. And when we mess up, we are very transparent about that. We don't try to blame shift. We don't try and make an excuse. Uh, we, we meet it head on and say, you know, we thought this change was going to work. Unfortunately, it led to this. Very sorry for the frustration. Thank you for trusting me. But because of this, we're actually going to have to go about it this way. And because you involve them, and you're not dictating them uh, like a dictatorship in an unhealthy, toxic culture. They absolutely feel like they're a part of it and they love it. And we ask for suggestions often. Uh, we ask for feedback. We ask for suggestions. If we are experiencing a problem, we ask, hey, if anybody has any input on how we can better handle this. And it's a conversation. I never make a decision and say, here you go, team. This is what I put in place and this is what we're doing. If you don't like it, let me know later. Like... There's none of that. Any change that happens is always a full conversation where everybody's able to voice their opinion if they choose to do so. And then we decide, okay, maybe we take a little of what you said, a little of what you said, and combine these together. It's a beautiful thing. So we invite them into the journey. We hear them. We're transparent. We increase communication. And, and that, that to me is huge because it, look at any, any company, any industry, I don't, whatever. Nine times out of ten, if there's a problem, there's an issue, whatever – it's because of communication. Things typically come down to community. I wasn't told this. Someone just told me this is what's go- what's new and the new process or whatever. So the fact that we are so transparent and the communication level is so high internally and externally helps us live out our core values and helps us uh, help our employees get to that next level. If they know oh, I, I, I get an opportunity to put some input on this new process that's going to be put in place. Yeah, I want to be a part of that decision, right? I don't want to be told. No one wants to be told what to do. Everybody wants to be heard. We allow our employees the chance to be heard, right? And I think that's a way that sets Grasshopper apart. Absolutely. And the balloon game. <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I saw I'm social media posts. There's was like some straws right. and some balloons, and they had to drop the balloon from the ceiling. You know what I'm talking about? We focus a lot on teamwork. <laughs> I know. And I, I love to it. Listen and having to, you know, what's cool about those games is you always see the natural born leader rise to the occasion, right? So those games are a little intentional, and so you know, yes. actually, we did this deserted island challenge not too long ago. I'll tell you about the balloon game. All right. But we did this deserted island challenge not too long ago, and. It was just, you have a team of people, each of you have to bring an item to a deserted island, right? How are you going to get off the island? And we saw this guy step up in his group and just naturally become a leader, helping to lead his team off of a deserted island who was extremely quiet, extremely timid. And all of a sudden he had all this personality. I'm like, bro. We've got a leader just sitting idling right there that we don't even have our eyes on. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So you see these natural born leaders rise to the occasion, but most importantly for us, right? That cohesiveness mixing departments, there's multi departments being mixed with one another where people are able to interact. And then maybe they learn one, one thing new about somebody that they don't usually interact with on a day to day basis, right? So it helps with that cohesion. It helps with being able to see the natural leaders. Um, and it helps with teamwork. So. 
It looked like fun. And you don't have to tell me about the, the balloon, balloon game, game, but you guys check out their social media and you can see what I'm talking about. But yeah. Or, that, well, yeah, tell me. That about was the epic. I mean, it was, the goal was cool. just there was an egg inside, and the goal was to build the structure accordingly with the egg. So when you dropped it from the ladder at the same height, the egg wouldn't shatter and break. And so I actually paralleled that to how we should be taking care of each of our customers and the fragileness of each customer. And the reality of perception, the reality of emotional intelligence, the reality of it doesn't matter if you said something this way or if they saw you do something this way, it's in their perception, right? So when you're trying, when you're working together as a team and you have one goal, right? We as a company have one goal too and we all work together as a team. When you're working together and you have one goal and the goal is to build the structure around the balloon and then safety around the balloon, however you want to do it. There was no rules to it. They were just given objects and materials, and this is what you've got. Don't let the egg break. And the goal is to not let it shatter, like I said. So the beautiful part about that is many eggs shattered, right? I told you we should have done this. I told you we should have done that. And I'm like, but this is the reality. Because the reality is is Luke's exact role here, right, which is unifying our customer experience and them understanding you know, yes, we take such great care of you. We want you to take such great care of the customer, but we're missing some gaps in the in-between. And listen, we don't have it right. We don't have it perfect, but we try like hell. So I want, I encourage them to think of each of our customers as eggs. And that sounds ridiculous. I know, but a raw egg can shatter very quickly and it can break very quickly. And we are responsible for safety and we are responsible for comfort in their homes and guys put their lives on the line every single day when you're dealing with gas and electrical and explosives. And you've got to parallel all that with providing an excellent customer service experience. So understanding you have a fragile, delicate egg that you are responsible for and what you need to do to protect their home, their safe place, them, their children, whoever they're serving at the time. So it really was a challenge for me to challenge them to look at customers differently. Yeah, that's cool. It looked like fun. Yeah. Uh, I have so many more questions. I know we're getting low on time. Um, one, qu- I I really want to ask about two things, really. What your focus for scalability is, mm-hmm. right? Because going that many employees and that amount of time, as Derek, I'm sure, knows, right? That is crazy and a difficult thing to scale. My other question is I'd just love to hear about the marketing that you're doing that brought you that fast, right? Mm-hmm. Cause I think anyone listening is sitting there like, Hey, stop talking about balloons, Mike, and find out yeah. what they did <laughs> to get that many clients. Um, but before we do those real quick, uh, did you want to give your leadership coach a shout out? Yeah. Dean Lieber. Uh, he's absolutely wonderful. Uh, find him on LinkedIn. Unfortunately, I don't have his email memorized to rattle it off right now, but his name, name is Dean Lieber, L E B E R. He's, one of the best decisions I made uh, to date and for the fractional cost to have him as a resource because of him, the trajectory of my business is much different. Okay. And I'll see it and we'll have a uh, Mac, our producer put a link if he's got a website Absolutely. or something like that in the show description. So Absolutely. All right. So tell us about scalability and marketing. So scalability, I think it's one of my favorite things to talk about because a lot of people think if you just throw a bunch of money at marketing, the phone's going to ring more and you're going to make more money because you're going to have more jobs, right? And I strongly disagree with that opinion. We worked really hard to not grow too big too quick. And we've actually throttled marketing slowly over the last two and a half years. So if you notice, right, we only just now launched into TV Mm -hmm. in the beginning of June. And we're only just now launching into radio. We haven't gone full blown with billboards yet or direct mail. We're about to hit direct mail very soon, but we mainly focused on social online and then organic really. And then, you know, word of mouth, seeing our vehicle on the road is the biggest, you know, people are wondering about your branding. If I told you that we have at least, I would say five out of 10 website submissions are because they saw our vehicle somewhere on the road. So if you ever have a question or a doubt about if you should invest in rebranding, that is my statistic for you on the amount of traffic we get just from that. But for scalability, right, don't just turn it all the way up and think that that's the key because you're going to have dollar bills blowing right out the window Mm -hmm. and you're going to end up going bankrupt because scalability starts from within, in my opinion. And being able to scale, you need to... Sometimes people think of scale and they think of scale equals more money. 
But if you scale wrong, scale equals less money or bankruptcy. And so for us, it was getting our pricing right, understanding that your gross profit tells you if your company is healthy or not, and then your net profit tells the story from there, right? So a lot of people are not even priced accordingly. Uh, if I sat down with your books and I looked at your cost of goods and I looked at your overhead costs and I looked at what you think your hourly rate is, even if you're a flat rate company, um, if you told me that you're only charging $140 an hour, I don't care who you are, you're losing money right now. Okay. So having your pricing correct is the number one ingredient to scalability in the first place before you ever think about marketing. And it was one of the mistakes I made early on, actually. If I only looked at pricing two and a half years ago, uh, we, we actually, I'd imagine we'd have many more percentages added to the bottom line, right? We've always been in a healthy position. Thank God for that. Mm -hmm. But being able to go you know, 21.5% EBITDA is what we ended last year at, which is incredible for a home service company. Mm -hmm. But being able to increase that is my goal now, right? But being able to look at ways where you can increase that and become even healthier as a company. And the reason why we're able to create opportunities that change lives and pay people so well, I mean, there's people at that company that make six times what I make in one week, and I love it. Because I love that they're able to make that crazy money. But the, the reason we're able to pay people and be able to facilitate life change is because we're priced accordingly and we know what it costs to run business. Yeah. That's a great answer. <laughs> so marketing, never go, never turn the dial all the way up and think that that's the key. Start with your pricing when you understand your pricing. You know, if you're a home service company. Anybody can argue with me, but really your gross profit should start at about 55% and no less than that. And I, met, I would imagine customer retention plays a huge role for you guys with the, the way that you care for your clients as well. Yeah, we work really hard to, um, for, we don't hire people who make $16 an hour answering phones. Our people that answer phones make a lot of money an hour because they're great. And they are wonderful people. And when, when you call my company versus another competitor, you can feel the difference in the hello, in the service that you get, in how they're interacting with you. And that's step one to locking in that customer. And they know that their role is every single time that phone rings, my job is to lock this customer and to become a grasshopper customer for life. And then the service tech's job is to show them that, right? So they're feeling it with me. Service tech or sales is showing them that. If it goes to install, then install is them actually seeing that. And then Grasshopper, so we have um, many people at pivotal points in the customer journey, but they feel it every step of the way without a missing link. And then the CSR's job know that that circle keeps continuing with them, right? So it's Every single person in our department knows. So the we serve above and beyond every time are one of our values. If we mess up, and we do mess up, but what makes us different as a company is how we take care of it from that point on that separates us from everybody else. And so serving above and beyond every time, like our CSRs know if there's ever somebody that calls in unhappy, management and the vice president is notified immediately. And the vice president gets on the phone very quickly to understand where did we mess up? Where did the missing link occur? How do we correct this? And then by the end of that phone call, they should be so impressed with us as a company, they forget what even happened in the first place. And I, I think that's why that the the customer uniform experience is so important too, and why the, it's all about the customer. And it, it's easier for us to drop the ball if we have you know that that cycle that Amanda just articulated, you know. It's a lot of different people, a CSR, a potential project manager, a potential installer. That's a lot of different people that the customer is seeing. So we have to make sure that our installer, when they show up to the house, is speaking the same language mm -hmm. that the, the salesperson is speaking. And the salesperson is speaking the same language that the CSR is speaking. Um, because it's very easy for things to break down along the way back to communication, right? A lot of, and nine times out of 10, problems arise from communication. That's all that that cycle is. It's communication. We we have it down internally to know what that process is, what the handoff is, um, and how it's articulated, um, but also the customer. The customer needs to be aware of the process. Customers shouldn't have any questions around, uh, when is someone coming to my house? They gave me a three-hour window, when are they coming? Or a four-hour window, when are they coming? They shouldn't have any questions around what is the next step in this process. 
because we've already articulated it to them. We have to make sure that our customers know the process. We've told our customer the process and we have it down internally as well. That, that, cause, because that's what the customer sees, right? They, the, is it's just that communication. So we have to make sure that we have that to a T. Yeah. We role play passing the baton to the next department as well. So we do a lot of role playing. We do a lot of training. So with Luke being here, he's kind of restructuring our role playing and how we're going to go about things. But we role play, right? If you're a service tech, we're going to role play how you're going to pass this baton to the install crew. If you're sales, we're going to role play how you're going to pass this baton there. If you're CSR, we're going to role, role play how you're passing this wherever because that transition is really important, right? Because the more confident a customer feels with you, that customer's with you for life. But if a customer feels like they're incompetent or they don't feel your confidence, then that's where we risk losing a customer. Hmm. I'm just trying to unpack all that in my brain. And at the same time, I know that we've been, we've had you guys on for an hour and I know I'm sure you got places to be. And I could talk about this all day. <laughs> oh my God. I, I have like 800 more questions I could keep you on for another four hours, but uh, what we'll have to do is we'll have to have, have you guys back because this has been amazing. I appreciate yeah. you being yeah, here. Yeah, we can the focus time. on topics, one topic at a time or something. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be amazing. But it, for so, right now, yes. vision, mission, pricing. If you're going to take anything out of this podcast, take those three away. Okay. Values. What did I say? Vision? Values, mission, <laughs> values, mission, pricing. Yeah. If you're going to take anything away, it's those three. Right there. Those three. That's awesome. Sure. And, and if people want to, uh, they want to get a hold of you, they want to find you, where do they find you guys? Sure. So our Facebook page is facebook.com underscore go grasshopper. Uh, I have my own LinkedIn page. If people have questions for me directly, it's Amanda Triolo on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me on Facebook as well. My email is amanda at gograshopper.com. That's awesome. Oh. Thanks. You're Appreciate welcome. you guys coming in. Thank I, you I, for I, inviting us. great information. Absolutely. It was amazing. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a lot. That was great. My brain's a little mushy now. It's like, <laughs> Good stuff. Listen to it a few times. Yeah, it's great stuff. So uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. Really appreciate your support. And uh, Derek, any final thoughts? Am I forgetting anything? Tune in. Let me throw out our feed spot ranking. Oh, yeah, that's right. We just got notified that we're in the top 40 for Blue Collar Podcasts. We're actually at the number 22 spot currently. Looking uh, to get to number one. Looking so to get number one, refers, yes. So we're first around. So awesome. send it to a friend. What do you got? All fair. Okay. <laughs> so uh, share the show, as our, our buddy Andy says. That's Good it. friend of mine, by the way. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Appreciate it.